All right, everyone, welcome to our fourth um, nutritional talk on plant-based protein. Um, my name is Dave Plumet. I am the owner and um, of Shoreland Athletics. I'm a trainer there. I've been there for 12 years. We're in Brantford, Connecticut. We're a hybrid between a, call it functional fitness facility and a CrossFit gym. Um, this topic is interesting to me. I've been down the rabbit hole of nutrition. Um, I've tried it all from um, paleo to keto to Adkins. I've dealt with, call it hundreds of people over the last 10 years discussing everything that is nutrition. Um, and more than more recently, plant-based nutrition has become very popular. Um, the reason people talk to me about plant-based nutrition, I actually wrote some stuff down. Um, there's a few reasons. One is they get some sort of blood panel from a physician. They have, they have a health scare. There's some concerns and they want to reduce their cholesterol or some, some other biomarker. Um, Netflix documentaries have made this topic very popular as well. Um, weight loss is always an obvious one. Some sort of social media influencer will uh, be big on a plant-based diet or a uh, prescription. And so people are always looking to try something new. And then we'll leave it at that. There's one other one, we'll leave it at that. Um, we have a great group of panelists today. We have uh, Jordan, Jillian, and Liz. They're gonna be answering most of the, um, the scientific questions. I'm here to help you on the ground level and what people are asking in the gym. Um, so regular folks as well. Um, but I will let them uh, take it from here. I will start with Jordan. You can introduce, intro, unmute yourself and introduce yourself and kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate UConn alumni and uh, having me on as a, as a panelist here. Um, I am a, a fellow UConn alum. I graduated in 2012 uh, with my uh, degree in nutritional sciences there. I'm actually a Connecticut native too. I grew up there. Um, I have my master's degree in exercise science and sports nutrition from Florida State University, where I also got my dietetic internship done. Um, I have uh, years of experience working in uh, pro sports. So um, in a professional setting, I've worked with in the NFL um, for five years now. I'm going into my sixth year in the NFL. I have collegiate experience as well. I was a director of nutrition at UC Berkeley. Um, and so I have a wide range of working with uh, a number of different types of athletes um, at the elite level professional level. And uh, I get I get a lot of these questions all the time. So I'm excited to, to kind of dive into this today to talk more about plant based uh, plant based eating. Liz, you're up next. Hi, everyone. My name is Liz Beluca. I am currently the direct director of sports nutrition here at UConn. I've been in this role for three and a half years, which is super exciting, but I'm originally from outside of Boston, um, studied undergrad at Syracuse University, became a dietitian out at Pepperdine. And then from there did um, worked at UNC Chapel Hill a little bit with their student athletes and was hired shortly after working here as the first full-time director of sports nutrition. Super excited to talk about this topic. I work with our athletes one-on-one -on -one through counseling and team talks, grocery store tours, and really helping them, you know, build life skills and, you know, make healthy habits that are going to impact their performance, not only in their sport, but in the classroom as well. So plant-based diets come up often. And so just debunking them with our athletes and helping them, you know, if they are looking to eat plant forward, how can we go about that in a way that's going to be helpful? So super excited to talk to you all today about this. Jill, you're up. Great, great. Can you hear me, Dave? Yeah, everyone? Perfect. <laughs> so hi to everyone. I'm Jillian Wanick. I am an assistant professor in residence at uh, UConn. I work in the dietetics program. So we are in allied health sciences. So we're part of College of Ag Health and Natural Resources. So I have a great job. I get to work both in the classroom and in the field with the dietetic students. So a little bit of the science and the education, you know, trying to change behaviors. I do practice on the side as a dietitian and do medical nutrition therapy, sport and wellness interventions, really across the lifespan. So one of the great things about working at UConn is that in 2018, I started taking students to Italy. 
Um, sadly, not this year, uh, but we would go for summer term for six weeks, really trying to immerse ourselves into the Mediterranean diet and explore the relationship of food, looking at food behaviors, chronic disease. And even though, you know, Mediterranean, there's a bunch of countries all around there, that Mediterranean meal pattern, it is plant forward. So plants central role on the plate. And today, you know, with Jordan and Liz, we're hopefully gonna help increase your understanding, inspire you professionally, personally, to include more plants in your meals on a daily basis. Great, thank you guys. Um, okay, so let's start with the questions. Uh, Jillian, this first one's for you. Um, what is plant-based nutrition now? I know Jillian just mentioned the Mediterranean diet. Is it, uh, is it vegan? Is it vegetarian? Is it plant forward? Um, can you define what plant-based is? And would you categorize it as a, a diet, something that's, um, or a lifestyle, something that's sustainable over time? Yeah, absolutely. I actually, I was going to step back just a little bit and maybe talk about COVID with the idea that COVID being this acute crisis, the terrible tragedy of everyone that we've lost in the past year. And then a lot of the research that's come out and linked COVID deaths to chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and really the whole idea about looking at our lifestyle and our nutrition and our physical activity, you know, all the changes that we could personally do, you know, things that Jordan and Liz are experts in, you know, and really when we look at how people are eating these days, people are not eating fruits and vegetables. The new dietary guidelines just came out. It's one in 10 US adults are, are meeting the recommendations, which some even say are low. Um, you know, 90% of us too much sugar, too much salt, and then 75% of us not enough physical activity. So we're gonna talk about diets, dieting, um, you know, lifestyle, meal pattern. And, and I think one of the things we all agree on in our pre-talk is that dieting is kind of short-term and lifestyle is long-term. So plant-based diet, really, I think we all thought plant-based meal pattern, plant-based lifestyle, plant forward as far as terms, really trying to be conscious about including vegetables, healthy fats, kind of real unprocessed food in the diet. And really just looking again at terms, vegetarian is avoiding meat and fish. And there's so many variations, you know, most common is lacto ovo vegetarian. So including dairy, including eggs. We have vegans eliminating all of this. And I think what we see a lot in our practice is really more of a kind of um, semi-vegetarian or flexitarian or pesco-vegetarian, including fish in their meals, um, you know, as patterns of, of, of eating habits. So, and it's dietary patterns is what the, you know, 2020, 2015 dietary guidelines recommends. And the other thing too is, is we wanna focus on food in this talk, you know, the idea that, um, you know, it's not a single nutrient or, you know, something in a bottle or a pill, but it's really a dietary um, pattern over time. So, you know, I think, I think that's really what plant-based, at least in, in our preliminary discussions means to us. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else want to chime in on that, Jordan or Liz or? Yeah, I think it's, uh, Jillian did, did a great job at explaining it. I think really this, this trend, plant-based trend, I mean, it's been around for years and years and years, but it's become becoming more popular in the last few years, but it's really important, like Jillian said, to kind of define what plant-based eating is because it's not, there's no single definition of, of what it means. And, and within plant-based eating or plant forward eating or more describing meal patterns versus a diet. So Julie mentioned that Mediterranean diet, which I think is more of an eating pattern, right? Than a diet, because you know diets tend to kind of give this connotation that you're eliminating something, right? And, and there's some 
Uh, there's so many diets out there, but anything that were plant is kind of the foundation. Plant foods are the foundation while including meat at some level. And again, it depends on what that individual uh, individual's lifestyle is and their goals are, it's going to be important. So kind of thinking about that and not really defining it as one type of diet, but an eating pattern, I think is important to remember um, today when we talk about all this. Okay. On, uh, on, on, in my world, people are always looking for black and whites. They want to know the quick fix. And so I'm uh, on the same page as you three where I try to steer people away from that and mostly a lot of grays and being plant forward is, um, is call it my definition of a plant-based diet where you try to fill up the majority of your plate or your food profile with fruits and vegetables and all different colors and, and try to get as, and try to find nutrient dense carbohydrate options. So that's, that's on my level. Um, let's, um, let's move on to the next question. This one's for you, Jordan. Um, what are the benefits for plant-based nutrition and why is it so trendy? Yeah, it's a, a two-parter there, but I think, um, so, you know, starting with the definition that we just talked about a little bit of what is plant-based eating, um, there's just a ton of, uh, of, of benefits to eating more of plant-based foods. So um, you know, first and foremost, uh, it's, uh, it can help with inflammation. So inflammation is this, is this hot word um, that a lot of people talk about, and it, it kind of, in my world, right, isn't really important for athletes. Inflammation is, is uh, you know, it's a little misunderstood. Inflammation is important in the body for certain types of injuries to help flush out toxins and things like that. Uh, so acute inflammation can be beneficial. Long-term inflammation can be uh, detrimental to health. So uh, following a plant-based eating and including a lot of foods that contain these antioxidants um, or phytonutrients is what we call them, actually has a lot of benefit to uh, controlling inflammation in the body. Um, and that's kind of ex exacerbated by, you know, lifestyle choices, smoking, drinking, um, weight gain, you know, being obese and some of these things that can lead to, um, you know, chronic inflammation that can be detrimental and cause a lot of damage in the body. So consuming foods uh, that are high in antioxidants, which are your plant-based foods, a lot of vegetables, leafy greens, uh, fruits, berries, blueberries, and, and, and healthy fats like um, pistachios and, and, uh, and uh, almonds and, and avocados. Those provide not just the macronutrients, the protein, carbs, fats that we need that provide the calories, but all those micronutrients and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients. So um, those are a lot of benefits uh, just from the anti antioxidant and inflammatory benefits. Um, uh, one of the biggest uh, things that most people lack in their diet is fiber. So either whether it's elite athletes or just the general, um, general population, like fiber is one of those things that, again, can help lower cholesterol, there's been proven scientific benefits, including more fiber in our diet that we just don't get enough of because a lot of the highly processed foods and things like that just don't contain fiber. Um, and you get a fiber soluble and insoluble fiber from a lot of the, the fruits and vegetables and whole grains that we've talked about that, that are poured in a, in a plant-based diet. Um, and so fiber can help control a lot of things, uh, including digestion. So it can be really good for digestion. Um, it's been shown to help with uh, lowering cholesterol numbers. Um, and so all of these things combined can really help. Um, and it's been, and been shown in, in clinical studies and longitudinal studies that, um, you know, following more of a plant forward, a plant-based diet can help reduce risk for a lot of chronic diseases and cancers um, and chronic uh, heart disease and things like that, that can, that can um, result from poor eating habits and other lifestyle choices. So switching to more of a plant-based or, or vegan type diet can really help benefit um, from, a, from just adding a ton of nutrient dense foods, uh, antioxidant, uh, anti-inflammatory foods, high fiber foods. So those are a lot of the, the benefits that you get. And, and with all that you, you get, um, you know, help support your immune system too, which is very topical right now with everything that's going on. So all of this can, can be beneficial. And so there's a ton of benefits to following a, a plant-based or, or plant forward diet. And so um, those are the main hitters. And I think that's um, you know, I, I think the majority of people, whether you're an elite athlete or not, um, you know, even a general, general consumer, general population can benefit from following, uh, eating more fruits and vegetables, like Jillian said, the new guidelines, um, and, and the, the facts are there that we're just not consuming enough. People aren't consuming enough fruits and vegetables in their diet. And there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, 
for your second part, why is it so trendy? I think you mentioned at the beginning there, social media has been, has, has really blown this up uh, over the past, you know, 12, couple years, 12, uh, 24 months, um, especially with the um, emergence of social media. Um, everyone thinks that they're an expert out there. Everyone's got an opinion, which is great, but we got to still got to have to also look at the facts and the science behind all of that. And so Netflix documentaries are a big one for me that even my athletes here um, pay attention to a lot of that stuff and they watch those documentaries and then have a lot of questions regarding it. Does it work for me? Is it actually beneficial? Um, and so you have to kind of, you know, those are the trends that are making it more popular in social media itself. Everyone, you know, you go on a Twitter and Instagram and, and what works for one person, a lot of people think might work for everyone. And that's just not the case. So you have to take an individualized approach, um, consult dietitians, the nutrition experts, like, you know, everyone here on the panel is, is, is consult and ask those questions with people um, that have studied this and, and are the nutrition experts and help guide that and make sure that it, it fits your lifestyle and what works for you. So, um, you know, everyone, there's a lot of information out there. You just kind of got to sort through it and make sure you're getting the right information, um, especially regarding uh, plant-based and, and vegan diets. Um, I think um, one of the big things you said when you opened up with um, inflammation um, and not just inflammations in your muscles and joints, um, we're thinking, I'm thinking more on like a cellular level and in terms of the health over time and um, just preventing things like heart disease and Alzheimer's. So, um, so that's always big when I talk about inflammation with um, my clients, my, the people that I see at the gym um, when, I, when I speak about inflammation and then getting the right fats in the omega-3s versus the omega-6s. And then obviously there's a domino effect in terms of your insulin resistance or how you kind of metabolize sugars. And so um, there's, in a, there's a whole list of benefits. It could be a, probably a 10 slide presentation if we went down that road. Um, but, does, um, but that's just a little bit of my take on it. But Jordan, I think you hit a lot of, of stuff there and um, no, it's very beneficial. Anyone else wanna jump in on this, Jillian or Liz? Yeah, I think it's interesting, David, hearing your perspective on the clients with chronic disease, because from my end, you know, our athletes are going to be bought in and motivated to eat more plant forward or just have a better diet knowing, hey, like fruits and vegetables fruits and vegetables are going to help decrease inflammation. They're going to decrease or help with recovery. They're going to help with sleep, boost immunity. So all those things are performance-based. And so it is really interesting based on what clientele you're working with, how you're going to get buy-in from, you know, your clients. So for my athletes, you know, using those buzzwords on, you know, antioxidants are going to help with recovery. Um, and here are some foods on how you can do that. So um, thinking performance-based is a way to help athletes kind of get more bought into um, eating well. Yeah, and I, I think I would just add that some people are looking for that quick fix and are, are drawn towards the supplement or, or you know, the you know, pre-made food. And, and really there's, I think over 4,000 phytonutrients Jordan was talking about you know, in the beginning. And we really don't know about all the synergy that happens, you know, in our body with these different components. So again, a, you know, real food, plant focused um, is your best option. Awesome guys, thank you. Um, Liz, this next question is for you. Um, you work with ath athletes every day at UConn. How can we reduce animal proteins and adopt more plants, but still get the same nutritional benefits to complement our workouts? Awesome. Yeah, so just to back up like Jillian did as well, um, you know, when athletes come to UConn right from high school, you know, they've likely, none of them have ever really thought about their nutrition at all, right? They, they come in, they were probably the best in their class. And now what's going to give them that edge? It's going to be their nutrition. So, you know, just to get a little bit of background, athletes have a higher um, protein need than, you know, the average human. So coming off the bat, athletes coming in, they have a higher need. Um, this is also for any, any recommendation for anyone is we want to eat every three to four hours around four to six times a day, likely for athletes. But in those meals, we want to have a source of protein in all our meals and snacks, which is really important, especially for our student athletes to, you know, meet their higher protein needs. A lot of the education that I do as well, just around, you know, plant 
plant-based or just plant forward is a lot of people forget that carbohydrates also offer protein. So your whole grains have protein and fiber in them to help with benefits or to help get that extra protein as well. And then in general, I, when I educate my athletes in a session, we call it the triple threat meal where you want a carb, a protein, and then you want color, you want your fruits, your veggies and healthy fats. So when they go into a dining hall and when they, you know, can cook in their apartment, they know what their plate should look like. So just to give you a little bit of background, this is going to be different for every athlete, but around for every meal, an athlete could range from 20 to 30 grams of protein. Obviously if it's a football player, O lineman, it could be a lot more, but for athletes, the protein recommendation is going to be 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. So I thought this would be helpful. I saw some comments um, below in the chat just about what are good food sources. So I hope this kind of helps um, break it down a little bit. So say an athlete wanted to have breakfast. This doesn't even have to be an athlete. This could be anyone really listening. Um, you know, a cup of dry oats alone has 10 grams of protein. I encourage our athletes to, when they make oatmeal, make it with milk. So you could use soy milk to increase the protein, get some calcium for bone health, vitamin D as well. You can add chia seeds for an extra, you know, three to six grams of protein, peanut butter, one to two grams of protein. I'm sorry, one to two tablespoons could, you know, anywhere from seven grams of protein, add some fruit, bananas, fresh, um, fresh berries. And then if, if someone wanted to, they could add a plant-based protein powder. I'm always going to try food first, but you know, with that breakfast, you're getting around 25 grams of protein right there, just based on those needs. So it, it totally can be done. I think our athletes need to plan ahead and um, really think about what our plant-based protein needs. This hopefully will be really helpful just thinking about lunch and dinner ideas. So in our dining halls, you know, it's different from being a pro athlete than maybe being a freshman or a sophomore that's only limited to dining hall food, right? So we do have chickpeas, we have edamame, black beans, we have black bean burgers, we have tofu, quinoa, foods like that. So an athlete could make a meal of quinoa, tofu with some chickpeas and some veggies. Um, you could do two slices of whole grain bread with some hummus topped with tofu, some olive oil, some veggies as well. Boca burgers and morning star patties are super, super easy and very convenient for our athletes. Those are um, microwave, you can microwave them or put them on a stove top for, you know, 10 to 12 grams per patty. There's also microwave rice, 60 second rice. So um, I think it's really just identifying what are your protein based foods. I'd sit with an athlete, work down those lists for meals and snacks. And then, you know, just some other snack ideas, right? Because an athlete is going to have higher protein needs, you know, an apple paired with two tablespoons of peanut butter is seven grams. If you're trying to add more veggies in, you could um, ha have some hummus with, you know, carrots or, or broccoli, have that out. You could do a smoothie with soy milk or um, plant-based protein powder. Vienna chickpeas is another option. So I, I think it really comes down to, you can eat plant-based, but you just have to be careful as an athlete, making sure that you're meeting your calcium needs to promote bone health, omega-3s. So it just depends what type of plant-based athlete you are. Um, we offer foods in our fueling station to help athletes recover. So, you know, chocolate milk or, you know, things like that. So really thinking about how you can use these foods to your benefit. But, um, but yeah, it takes some time and planning, but it's definitely doable. You just have to think about, okay, if, if my iron's low, you know, you're not eating heme iron, which is from animal protein. So, you know, checking in, we could do an analysis and then we can see where we would need to supplement if they can't meet their needs through whole foods. So um, you just have to be mindful, but it is doable with um, just the right idea and good motivation and healthy habits for sure. Awesome. Uh, Jillian and Jordan, I'd love to get your take on these questions. Jillian, could you give me yours first? Sure. Uh, I, I'm just going to give a shout out to Liz because I follow her on Instagram <laughs> and she has awesome meal suggestions all the time. If you're ever looking for a healthy uh, plant-based food, most of her uh, posts are on that, but I love the other um, uh, talking about the protein and plant-based foods and, you know, one that it does take a little bit of planning as does any meal pattern, but also really getting your protein in at the, you know, throughout the day, that breakfast and that lunch period, a lot of Americans are really light on protein and then just so heavy at the, that dinner meal time. So um, considerations of, of really kind of spreading it out through the day so your body can, you know, have the maximum for um, muscle synthesis. 
Yeah, I think you guys really uh, nailed a lot of it, Liz. You did a great job at, at explaining all that and, and how, how student athletes and, and professional athletes and non-athletes alike can start to integrate a lot of these because as, as the trend has really become more popular, we're seeing more and more plant-based foods and so that are available. So it used to be, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there wasn't as much variety. Now you're seeing a huge uh, boom in the, the amount of foods and, and the variety of foods that you can, it makes it more convenient to be uh, a plant-based uh, diet, um, um, you know, include those foods more often. Um, you know, I think it is important. Uh, people do have this misperception about protein. Um, it is really, you know, we, spreading it throughout the day is, is going to be really more important than eating these large um, amounts of protein at one time. Um, you know, a lot of the athletes are, are, especially by the time they get to my level, are, are pushed so much about protein and how important it is for muscle development and muscle synthesis. And, and it, it is, but, you know, muscle protein is only, is only about 30% of the total protein in our entire body. We use protein for a whole bunch of other things, cellular structure, our immune system, transporting, transporting things in our blood. Um, you know, it's used for a, a number of components outside of just muscle building, which I think protein is mostly associated with. And our bodies are more efficient at, um, you know, digesting smaller amounts over time. So, you know, but, you know, a lot of athletes over consume protein by the time they get to me, when in, in reality, if you're over consuming protein, you're not consuming a lot of like the plants and, and carbohydrates that are also essential and very important. Um, for a part of their diet. So finding balance um, and uh, spreading that out throughout the day it is really important too. Um, and, and then one other thing, you know, I'll touch on is, is, is making sure that the protein qualities, right, the amino acid content is a little bit different between animal proteins and plant proteins. And that, that's kind of one of the, the biggest debates on, you know, our body's not as able to digest or utilize plant-based proteins due to the amino acid content. So when we talk about planning and, and thinking a little bit more about, you know, going in the protein, the plant proteins that we consume, um, we want to make sure that we're getting a, a good amino acid profile. And, and, and it is true that since we are mammals ourselves, you know, we, we're better utilizing animal proteins in, in our digestive tract and using them in our human, human bodies, but we can still get a good amount of amino acids from plant-based sources as well. And, and you just got to plan it a little bit more combining it a little bit more. You know, um, and maybe, you know, if you're, you're an athlete and, and you're using a plant-based protein, um, we'll, we'll touch on that, I think a little bit later, but a plant-based protein powder, you maybe consume, you know, another 20% more. So make sure you're absorbing all of that versus a, a whey protein. So, um, yeah, I think it, it can easily be done, uh, whether you're a pro athlete or an athlete or, or just a general consumer, like it's, it's, a, it's an easy way now with, with the variety of options available to them. Awesome guys, Liz. I think that was a great recommendation as well in terms of the um, the the grams of protein. The recommendation twenty to thirty grams. I think that's spot on. Um, again, when I reference my experience, I'm talking about the gym level um, and clients that I meet, um, and then the individuals that tend to uh, that are eating well but are a little off base that hold on to a little extra body fat um, are generally people that overconsume protein as well. It's not that they're eating poorly, it's they're eating 40, 50 grams of protein each meal and call it 20, 30 grams of uh, carbohydrates. And they, and so just by making that small tweak and then pointing them in the right directions and uh, they seem to do very well. So um, moving on, this question is for Jillian, how does a plant-based diet, or I'm sorry, how does a plant-based lifestyle affect our anthropometrics? And I guess we're talking about uh, muscle mass, bone density, body fat, all the above. So, yeah, absolutely. So, again, let's do a few terms to start off with. Anthropometrics, it's both body weight and body composition, right? So, all of us were comprised of water, bone, fat, muscle. You often hear those terms fat mass or body fat percentages or your fat free mass, which then we've switched over to be talking about your lean body mass, your percent of muscle, like Jordan was talking about. So what we use, everyone's familiar with it as just the rough measurement, it's your BMI, your body mass index, right? It's your height and weight formula. It's a general 
measurement, it just puts you into different buckets. We say your normal weight, overweight, obese, normal BMI goes up to 25, overweight goes up to about 30, and then tip over 30, and you're considered, um, you know, in the obese category. And so what we see in um, the BMIs of the vegetarian athletes um, compared with omnivores is typically they do have lower BMIs, but it's not huge. It's one to two points lower. But I think really BMI, it doesn't tell you the whole story because it really doesn't tell you about that body composition. And I'm sure that Jordan and Liz can talk about how many of their athletes, they're miscategorized using BMI just because their muscle mass is so high. And then if we just flip and look at the, you know, other end of the spectrum, you know, I, the athlete in all of us, but we know that, you know, smoking really is the new sitting, right? Or sitting is the new smoking, however that uh, saying goes. And um, you could be in a, even a normal BMI category and have what's called sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is uh, an excess amount of fat and a lower amount of um, muscle mass. So after 30, for all of you viewers out there, you do begin to lose muscle. When you take that picture of your quadriceps, um, you know, it might be that it's the same diameter, you know, decade after decade. Um, but as we age, your percent of fat is increasing and your percent of muscle is decreasing. Um, three to five percent per decade and we know that down the road this is why we have um, loss of function physical disability poor quality of life um, you know people who can't get out of a chair without their arms or they can't get up off the floor so you know it's again looping back into the nutrition and the and the physical activity I think Jordan uh, was talking a little bit about, you know, um, athletes overeat protein and sometimes have that misconnection between, you know, you have to eat the protein, but then you have to do the work. You have to put the time in the gym to get that muscle strength. So, you know, diet and movement and strength training as Jordan and both Liz have talked about are, are all part of it. So that's kind of the anthropometrics of plant-based, but we also look at the biometrics, right? So biometrics, blood pressure, cholesterol, your um, glucose levels, right? And so a lot of the data that we have is from, it's called the DASH diet. It's dietary approaches to stop hypertension five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables, a really a plant forward um, approach to eating. And this diet has shown to reduce both systolic and diastolic blood pressure between five and 8%. So um, an excellent, you know, uh, well-researched approach to then improving that biomarker. Cholesterol, it's controversial, right? Um, cholesterol measurements and, you know, sat fat, no sat fat these days. Um, typically, uh, plant-based regimes have reduced um, LDL, so low density lipoprotein levels between 15 and 30%. And so that is a significant benefit, you know, even though we're not as worried about cholesterol in our diets anymore, that LDL biomarker still has got strong uh, association with heart disease. And then as far as blood sugar, I think Jordan and Liz were both talking about the fibers, um, the soluble viscous fibers that we see in plants. And so that is uh, helpful for reducing blood sugar, reducing spikes in blood sugar, keeping a more level um, progress as you, know, you go through your digestive process. Um, also there's um, the um, minerals that are there, right? So rich in magnesium um, to help regulate that blood glucose. So, you know, I think, you know, overall, when we look at, you know, both the anthropometrics and then in at the biometrics, you could say pretty much that plant-based lifestyle has positive effects on both of these. Great. Jordan, Liz, you want to chime in there? Um, Liz, this question is for you. And uh, do you have clients that you're working with that are plant-based? And if so, um, how is their um, performance um, either decreased or increased? And it's not a question here, um, but I'm really interested to get your take on 
um, people on at the collegiate level. Do you mind re-asking that? Yeah, so <laughs> I guess my question is like, um, if you're working with any plant-based um, athletes currently, and if so, have you noticed um, any uh, performance drop-offs or increases on a collegiate level? And I, I, I'm asking this based on kind of like, on a based piggybacking off the last question to talk about, you know, anthropometrics, those type of markers. Yeah, um, it's actually not super common for athletes to really come into my office and say, hey, I want to go plant-based. I do have to say after the Game Changers documentary, that I believe that was last year, that was maybe the first time we had like two or three um, come to my office and ask. I did have one athlete that tried to do it by himself. And I think that's a really good message that he, he took out animal protein, but didn't put anything in there. So he was, you know, he was fatigued, he was starving, he had low energy. So, um, so there's that side of it. And then um, there are a few athletes that have adopted, adopted a plant-based diet. And, you know, there, I think the biggest thing is it's, it's not really a, I mean, it is about the plant forward, but the plant forward means nothing. If you're not eating on a schedule, if you're not eating every three to four hours, if you don't have those balanced meals, but yeah, I think those athletes have better recovery. They they sleep well. Um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers that question. But it, it's not super super common. But I think the main message throughout working with athletes in general is always, you know, plant forward because naturally a, a healthy diet or a diet that's going to promote performance is going to be rich in you know fruits and vegetables and um, things like that. So um, not super common, but I've seen kind of the. It, it can work. Or if you don't do it well and you don't see a registered dietitian and you try to do it by yourself, you're likely going to have some issues there. I do love that eating on a schedule, right? I do love that advice. So thank you. Um, next question, guys. Uh, this one's for Jordan. Are there certain plant-based proteins that are better than others? And if so, what do you recommend to your players? So to another two-parter. Yeah, I think it, it is really important. I think there is a little bit of a, a misconception. So we first have to define protein, okay? So in our in the human bodies, there's 20 essential amino acids, right? Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And I mentioned before, proteins used for a number of things. More commonly, right, more people know about it than in its muscle building, uh, muscle protein synthesis ability. Um, but we have like things like collagen in our body. We have every single cell for structure. We have components of just our gastrointestinal lining. We have transport proteins that help transport things around the body. So protein is important for a number of functions besides just muscle building. But in order to do that, we have 20 amino acids. And then of those, uh, we have nine that are considered essential means that, you know, we can, we only get them in our, through our diet. So the other amino acids, we can uh, synthesize ourselves through, you know, in the, in the human body. Um, and then those nine have to be provided in order to build uh, complete proteins in, in the body. So um, usually you start to compare to animal-based products because animal-based proteins contain all of those essential amino acids. And so um, when we talk about complete, profile, uh, complete um, amino acid profiles, uh, there's a lot of plant-based protein sources that don't contain those nine essential amino acids that can contribute. So a lot of times you have to compare them. And so um, usually they, you know, they, there's a protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. So basically evaluates, uh, protein quality based on both amino acids, which are those building blocks of protein, and then how well your body digests it. And so we always compare it to, um, a casein protein, which is a, as an animal protein, it's a milk based protein. So that's got a, you know, a level of one. And then we kind of look at animal based proteins, um, compared to that. So Soy protein is actually the most comparable and most digestible and most readily available um, plant-based protein source. So it really is the best in terms of amino acid profile and digestibility and absorbability. Um, from there, you can look at pea proteins as well, which is also very comparable to soy protein. So um, it's a little bit less. Um, and then after that, you go to um, like nuts. So pistachios are actually re recently in the last year or two, have come out that they've become a complete protein source. So within, you know, one serving is about 49 kernels or 49 nuts, you still get six grams of complete protein. And the best part about that is, you know, you don't have to cook it. It's easy on the go, it's portable. It doesn't have to be prepared like a lot of animal proteins. Um, so nuts like pistachios are, 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 you know, are good. Then we look at grains. So things like quinoa, which is a complete plant-based protein that's not nut-based for those that are allergic to nuts. 
Um, you have chickpeas, uh, soybeans, like edamame. Uh, there are things like um, tempeh and tofu, which are really, they're soy-based products that are very common as like plant-based uh, protein sources. So tofu, uh, you know, three ounce provides eight grams of, of protein, which is, which is a lot. You got one cup of quinoa, which provides eight grams of complete protein. Um, amaranth are these ancient grains that have a lot of um, plant-based protein sources. So one cup of amaranth, which is kind of like a quinoa, you know, style uh, grain has uh, one cup provides actually 26 grams of protein. Um, then you go to edamame, which has 18 grams of protein per serving. Um, pistachios, like I mentioned, have six grams of protein. Um, and then there's there's some new new stuff out there called, um, well, it's more more common now. It's called mycoprotein. It's actually been used in, in Asia for hundreds of years. And there's a lot of these um, meat alternatives that have, have really been po popping up. And I think, you know, there's a lot of questions about the impossible burger and the beyond meat. And, and there's this, this, um, it's called mycoprotein. It's actually a fungus, um, that's been used in Asia for years and it most commonly mimics the meat, the structure of meat protein. So, so a lot of the challenges with these meat alternatives is like the palatability and like the texture of them, um, and taste of them can be a barrier for a lot of people. Um, and another thing to keep in mind with a lot of those meat alternatives is they're not necessarily healthier, right? They're, they're still highly processed. There's a lot of different ingredients added to them. Um, they just don't contain animal products. So there's a debate whether or not they're actually healthier for you, but if they're, they're great protein sources, if you, if you choose not to consume meat. Um, and, and there's this idea of, uh, I think it's important to mention, right? Everyone has their own reason for going plant-based and and so uh, for a lot of people, you'd wonder like, why would someone want to eat uh, a burger or something that mimics like a burger that includes beets that even like bleeds like a burger if they don't want to consume meat? Well, some of those people might choose to be plant-based for environmental reasons, right? There's a huge impact that we need to you know, be aware of in the environment and global warming and everything to take care of the planet. The, the impact and the carbon footprint of of animals, uh, chickens, uh, livestock, different um, cows, uh, you know, beef uh, in this in this country and in the world, um, provide you use a lot of water, you use a lot of food and resources, and, and provide a lot of waste that that contributes. So some people choose to help, you know, go plant based for that reason and choose more plant based products because it's environmentally friendly, right? So like a mycoprotein that I was talking about, the fungus actually, you know, only uses it uses ninety percent less water and resources compared to you know a chicken or a, 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 a beef or a cattle. Um, so for environmental reasons, there's ethic reasons too, right? Some people believe in animal rights, and and, and that's a reason why they choose to go plant based or vegan because they want to eliminate, you know, choose that for the for their own personal reasons. And then you have religious aspects as well. Um, and then you have health reasons that we kind of touched on already. Like what are the health benefits of choosing going plant-based and choosing you know, plant-based products? So with all that said, there's so many alternatives now and you can do it. So athletes, you know, you touch on your second part of the question um, and kind of what Liz was saying is I don't really have a lot of um, plant-based uh, plant or vegan athletes. You know, the game changers was huge because it, it raised a lot of awareness. And I think going back to talking about social media and why this is all popping up, I think some of them, um, you have to be a little bit cautious and dive into like, what's the science behind some of it? Is it giving you factual information? But at the end of the day, it's, it's raising awareness and we're having these discussions that are, you know, you know, we're having these panels that we can discuss it and talk about it and what are the real benefits of it? Um, so everyone has their different reasons. Um, I've been, this is my fifth season with the 49ers. I'm going into year five already. And I've had, um, I have not had any vegan athletes, but I've had a lot of questions like Liz said. I have a lot of plant-based athletes because my, my program and what I run here with my chef and the foods that we provide is plant forward. So there's a lot of strategy as Liz knows of how, you know, when, when you're feeding a large group of people or athletes, you know, putting plants first down the buffet line or having them more readily available or in the front to help younger athletes or athletes in general that sometimes can get away with consuming you know, genetically they're, they're gifted um, and they haven't had to pay attention to it. So there's, there's that component. Um, so yeah, it's just that education part too. Like we have, we have to make sure that they understand the benefits of it, what they're, you know, what these documentaries and social media and people that are telling them to go vegan or plant-based, um, you know, what's the reason behind it. And like I mentioned, there's a ton of different reasons why someone would want to go. And our, our job here as dietitians and nutrition professionals is to help guide that and sort through all of that. 
to make sure that people are making the right decisions. And then when it comes to protein, like making sure that you're, you're meeting all your, your nutrition needs and, and making sure you're providing all those essential amino acids and things that you can do it and you can be successful with it. It does just require a little bit more planning and, and purpose behind it. Um, but it can easily be done. There's a lot of options out there. Um, and, and there's a lot of different reasons why people would do it, but overall the overarching theme is there's a, there's a benefit to eating more plant plant-based foods in your diet. Uh, that was great. Thank you. Uh, good advice on the soy and the pea, and then kind of giving a little bit more of a background, um, solid, um, Jillian or Liz, anything on, um, recovery? Um, or on that same thread? Um, I just have something to add that it could be just interesting how Jordan was kind of saying that, you know, really figuring out why is this person eating plant-based or why are they a vegan or, or the, the reasoning behind it isn't environmental. I think it's not too, too common, but just something in my work that is something I'm aware of is, you know, to make sure someone isn't vegan or vegetarian because it's a form of restriction. So really like, and that's where, you know, disordered eating could stem from with athletes on trying to perfect their diet. So this doesn't just have to do with athletes and disordered eating, but really understanding how to be plant forward, not choosing to be plant-based or vegan or vegetarian to take something out of your diet. Um, so just, um, I just thought that would be helpful. Just a different perspective on, you know, my work with athletes as well. Yeah, and I, I was gonna say, just also chiming in that, um, like Jordan was doing, working with a chef or Liz does with her, um, Yukon Husky nutrition Instagram, a, a lot of becoming more plant-based or plant forward is knowing how to cook these different foods and how to make them delicious. And so whether it is like black beans and sweet potatoes and cilantro, that's, you know, becomes the center of your plate or you're working with barley and, you know, craisins and oranges and putting it in, you know, a jalapeno dressing. It, it's just, uh, there's so much that's out there now too, that can make it easier and, you know, more delicious to cook. So. Yeah. As a, as a 42 year old man, I'm a little <laughs> bit more wise and I've learned how to cook. I certainly didn't have those skills in college. My budget's a little bit bigger. And so I'm shopping at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and choosing organic when I can. Um, and so, yeah, I think having the skills as well will make you successful in a plant-based diet um, or a plant-based lifestyle. And I keep saying diet, I need to correct myself on that. Um, but yeah, I think that's very important. I think the ladies have it covered. Us, us guys need to refine our skills in the kitchen. And so I've been working on that personally. So um, I yeah, Dave, I think it's actually important there to mention that I think everyone can be successful on it. I think a lot of times people do think that eating is very common, Liz and Jill, like people say that eating healthy is expensive, right? So it's more convenient and, and, and healthy to or uh, more uh, cost effective to just eat fast food. Um, and it is more convenient, but the cost of health, like long term and the, that's the negative health consequences of not getting enough nutrients is way more expensive than taking the time and skills to plan your meals out, eat nutrient dense foods, learn to cook in the um, you know kitchen a little bit, which is another benefit I think of this past year as people are put, becoming more, they're having more time to prepare food, um, plan foods out, cook at home, refine some of those skills. Um, but I, I think it, it is a little bit of a misperception that like you, it, eating healthy is expensive. It just, you gotta prioritize it I think is, is one of the thing that you know most people you know, at least that I talk to, they just have to understand like it is convenient. You just got to have some resources, some easy recipes. Um, I use social media as well. And, and to, to try to help, you know, you can make a super easy 20 minute, you know, nutrient dense meal that doesn't take a lot of time. Um, you know, it's just taking the time and, and looking up some of those resources and making sure you can do it. Um, and you don't have to be, a, you know, a great cook in the kitchen, Dave, to to, um, to eat well, um, you just gotta, you just gotta find out what works for you and, and just make some, make some, uh, commit some time to it, you know? All right. Um, Liz, I think this question is for you here. Um, thanks Jordan. And I'm, I am working on my skills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Liz, this question is for you is plant-based sustainable. And the second question is, 
um, what are some ways in which we can be successful adopting this lifestyle? Yes, I, I totally think it is sustainable. I think, Dave, you said this earlier, a lot of people take, you know, it's not a diet lifestyle, but very black and white, right? It's not after this webinar, you don't go home and say, well, you're probably home watching this, but you don't, you don't say, okay, I'm going to do plant-based and then, you know, Saturday I have a cheeseburger and it's over. Like I, I failed and it's, it's over. Like, that's not the point of this. The point is, how can I add more plant-based foods to my diet that are going to affect my health in a positive way to, you know, help with your overall health. So um, I think also a good example could be like social events. If, if you're eating plant-based all week and then on Saturday, you're planning on going to a carnival with your family and all they're serving is cheeseburgers and chicken sandwiches, just because you choose that option doesn't mean, I think sometimes people want to need to feel like they have to put a label on themselves. Like, hi, I'm Liz, I'm a plant-based eater. Like to, to us dietitians, that's super odd, but I know like anyone listening that they could feel like they have to identify with a certain way of eating. So you can look at that two ways. Maybe it's socially, it's just a good time to be with your family and have you know, like, you know, animal meats on the weekends or things like that. Or maybe you're planning ahead and you know, hey, I'm gonna to go to that carnival. I'm gonna plat I'm gonna pack my own sandwich and I'm gonna, you know, be prepared like that. So I think really thinking about what's gonna work for you and your lifestyle. This it's about adding it something in, not not what can we take out. Um, ways that can be sustainable are, you know, anytime you go to the grocery store, whether you're eating plant-based or not is to make a list, right? Make a list before you go. So, um, you know, what meals are you going to make for the week? Like Jordan was saying, they don't have to be these gourmet meals. You can really just get your staples in and have some backup easy meals. What, you know, protein rich snacks are you going to get that, um, can be easy to you know grab and go. So, um, you know, also having plant-based foods around the house. So if you have kids or, you know, if you live alone, you know, do you have hummus in your fridge where you can just pull out carrots and broccoli and, and have that available or pistachios or, you know, apples and peanut butter. So when your kids come home, like Jordan was saying too, at the beginning of a line, when athletes come through, those foods are available. And so your kids or yourself, you're more likely to eat those foods if, if they're there. Um, and, and lastly, just thinking about what works for you. I think, um, like I just said earlier, you really have to think about what's my lifestyle, like, what's my job? How, how would I be able, how could I incorporate this? And, and maybe start slow. Maybe instead of feeling like I have to do this, you know, five days a week or seven days a week, maybe you say, hey, um, every Monday I want to focus on this. And, and hopefully the goal, and this is with my athletes as well, is when you're helping them eat better or eat healthier or maybe eat plant forward, plant-based forward, they're bought in when they start to feel better, when they're seeing those results. So it's not going to become, um, something that's going to be like over your, they're just feel like another burden. It should be something that's, Hey, when I eat this way, I feel my best. When I eat fruits and veggies, I, I recover better. So thinking about what works for you, but also, um, you know, doing it enough that you're going to reap the benefits of it. And, and that's how you'll continue to do it. So, um, just knowing that it, your diet in general is always individualized and, um, it has to work for you and not what you see on social media. And um, shout out to Jillian, I'm laughing because I think people thought to follow my personal Instagram. So Fueling Huskies is the Instagram page that you wanna follow, um, but that's where our athletes, and it's not just for our student athletes, it's really for anyone. So just great, easy meal and snack ideas. Um, today we talked about Myth Monday. So we just have different segments of just easy meals to make. So um, yeah, follow along and hopefully you can take some tips there that can help you as well. Yeah, I did mean the fueling huskies. <laughs> okay, I'll, accept, I'll accept your follow, but I wanted to clarify fueling huskies. As a business, we pay for followers. So yeah, that's pretty cool that you just got a ton of fans. Um, and, and don't unfollow me. But. Any, um, uh, this is to any, to all three of you, um, final thoughts before we wrap up the, the call here? I was going to say, just um, continuing on what Liz said, um, you know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing or black and white. And so I love that, um, you know, it could just be you're starting with meatless Mondays, but I do think it's important to be intentional in your health behaviors. And so I guess 
one nutrition takeaway tip is that, you know, it's spring or tomorrow it's going to be spring. I'm looking out the window. So, you know, start to focus maybe on seasonality, um, local foods, maybe add a weekly trip into the farm or farmer's market. And then don't forget to be active. So, you know, a lot of the new research points to just even little bits of movement throughout the day. But the latest article I read said, take a walk after dinner, 10, 15 minutes, walk around the block, improves your blood glucose, helps with digestion, and can help you sleep better. So nutrition and activity tip. Yeah, I think it's uh, the common mantra, balance and moderation um, for dietitians. And so no matter what you guys choose to do or whatever someone chooses to do, make sure that it works for you. Taking an intuitive eating approach, I think is becoming very popular and common, listening to your body, becoming active, eating in balance and moderation. I think it is, um, you know, we'll share some resources. I've seen some of the questions here, but I'll be happy to share some of the resources I have, um, you know, to help include some of these, these recipes a little bit more. Um, eating on a budget, it, it, is, it is possible. I think there's a lot of resources out there. I, I do work here in the community with uh, in the Bay Area um, with the local urban communities um, in connection with the 49ers to help raise awareness and promotion with, especially with youth and how they can have access to a lot of these healthier foods. Um, and, and there are a lot of companies and programs out there and, and we'll share that too, that, that can help provide a lot of these foods. There's a lot of wasted foods. When we talk about environmental, there's a lot of wasted foods that there are a lot of great companies out there that are, are able to help provide that and, and, and deliver them to your door now, especially with COVID has really streamlined that process and made it more convenient for a lot of people. Um, so I'm happy to share a lot of that stuff as well. And um, I write for a number of media publications. And so my, a lot of, I've wrote a couple articles here on, on a lot of this stuff. So I'll be happy to share that. Um, so more people can get some ideas of, of what we've talked about today, but um, balance and moderation, get out and exercise, drink plenty of water as well, stay hydrated. Um, those are kind of the foundations, uh, no matter what type of, uh, eating pattern you choose to follow. Um, you know, those are, those are just the common, common themes, I think that, that can help anyone improve, you know, live a healthy lifestyle. All right, guys. So that's our hour. Um, Liz, Jillian, Jordan, guys, thanks for, uh, for jumping on the call and allowing me to be your moderator. Um, I think the 200 people that are on this call will um, certainly benefited from getting um, some more understanding of what plant-based actually is and how to incorporate it into their lifestyle. So um, with spring just right around the corner, um, now's the time to ramp up your, your nutrition and exercise as you talked about, Jillian. Um, so thank you so much, guys. Enjoy. Um, and uh, UConn Nation, we're out. Yeah, go Huskies. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.